Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Judy Dove. I'm one of the leaders of the Hennepin County Dog Project. Uh, I started training dogs when I was in high school back a long time ago. And since then, uh, I, I started in Golden Retrievers uh, in my teens and took a break for college and other stuff. And then I went into Rottweilers and did obedience and Schutzhund and tracking and all sorts of stuff with Rottweilers and did rescue. And then I took a break after a car accident for a while. And now I have skipper keys and I had a boxer in there too. Uh, I'm currently an AKC uh, Canine Good Citizen Evaluator and also a Temperament Test Evaluator. And I volunteered at shelters working with behavioral problems to help get the dogs adopted or uh, to help them get their lives more comfortable. Since I started in dog training many years ago, it's changed. When I first started, it was truly obedience training. The dog absolutely obeyed the person. There, there, was, there was no negotiation. It's since evolved to the point there there's the concept of teamwork. And there's become some real science behind dog training. We train all types of animal training. Uh, part of the science is biology. With the work that they've done with the human, uh, with the dog and the horse genomes, they found that 50% of behavior is actually biologically determined. So whenever the animal is born, half of how they're going to behave is already set. People have the possibility of changing that, but animals don't. We don't think they have that capacity. Uh, there are basically two types of animals in the world. There are the eat, eat in, the like the herd animals, the rodents, which reproduce a lot to feed a lot of animals. And then there are the eaters. The eaters, also known as predators, are tend to be intelligent. They pro possess me the means to take down prey. That can be speed, claws, teeth, they use teamwork, they can ambush, many options. One thing that's common amongst all animals is the conservation of energy. We can say that a basset hound is not lazy, they just conserve their energy very, very well. But conservation of energy is important because if you waste too much energy, you need more food and food can be hard to come by. Another part of science is arousal states. Normally we toodle along and we're good and we move along. But if we get very frightened, <coughs> oops, there's a bunny in the window, I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, the arousal states. And biologists call these the three Fs. And what that is is fight, flight, or sex. And what that is, is when adrenaline is, for whatever stimulus, adrenaline is dumped in our body and we need to do something. Or we're programmed to do something. If we're in an adrenaline state, that's the opposite of a good learning mode. So you want to, when you're in an arousal state, for the most part, you're in a survival mode. PTSD is an extreme part of that, and that's a very high arousal level and very negative learning experience. And a funny thing has come up lately is that most many findings, many scientists are finding that animal mammalian learning occurs most often in flight. That is when the animal is most likely to learn things. They're calm, they're receptive of new information. They want to engage. And we're almost done with the science part of this. That say we walk into the kitchen after work and there's this nice smell of a nice home cooked dinner and we get really hungry. Even if we weren't hungry when we walked in the house, we get hungry. That is considered an unconditioned response. And I quote from Google, an unconditioned response is the response to that is unlearned response to the unconditioned stimuli. The smell of food hunger equals the response. 
what we do in training is we're working with the conditioned res response. And that is, again, I quote, the automatic response established by training to an ordinarily neutral stimulus, end quote. Again, from the Google directory. And what that is, is uh, Karen Pry Pryor, I think many people have heard of Karen and her work with clickers and dolphins and whatever. And that has been passed along through other, a lot of work in zoo animals, dolphins, and so on. But there were people before that that did that. The Pavlov was the first one that noticed the conditioned response when he was working with dogs in his lab in Russia more than 100 years ago. And also B.F. Skinner, who was famous for his work with pigeons. And Skinner was at the University of Minnesota for a while. And Skinner found that shaping behavior works, where you make incremental changes to get the, be the behavior that you want to see. You know, you could start by getting the pigeon to move, say a few feet forward and give them a treat, a few feet forward, until you can get the pigeon climbing up a stack of boxes to get to another reward. One thing about when um, when Karen Pryor was working with wild animals and and her associates also is one thing they they didn't have to worry about was the criteria the animal did it or they didn't do it if they did it they got a treat that was good if they didn't do it they didn't get a treat that's fine no biggie there was no criteria it was a yes or no so in the 1980s or 90s when dog training was at that time primarily adversive conditioning. The dog was corrected with leash pops and pulls and whatever, and something wasn't performed correctly. It was considered, uh, now it would be considered punishment. At best, negative reinforcement. Because you we were training with fear at that point in time. With the advent of the clickers, clickers, initially, trainers were rewarding everything. The dog breathed, they got a treat. The dog took a step, they got a treat. It was kind of, we were training brat, which is unfortunate. Uh, so now people started adding with the positive reinforcement, they were also adding criteria. Yes, we're doing shaping, but if the dog only did a partial effort, no, no, no reward. If they did a three quarter effort, no reward. This was, of course, after building the concept, but the dog had to perform to the expected standard. We're getting rid of the brat. The, poor, the not rewarding poor performance. I was whining over there. I'm sorry. Uh, not rewarding poor performance got rid of a lot of the bratty behavior that dogs were showing. They started respecting their handlers again. And all of a sudden they started understanding what was expected of them, which was important. And the concept of teamwork really started evolving. And with teamwork what became engagements. There were two, two entities that were working together. I remember back in, I think it was 92 or something, one of the local training clubs had what was called the hot dog class. And what it was, the people in the class would sit there with a bag of diced up hot dogs and they would establish eye contact with their dog and reward. The dog would look them in the eye and they get rewarded. A lot of those dogs went on to become obedience trial champions, but it was, it was a start. But we're probably not going to do trained to that level, but we're going to, we are going to use criteria. We're not going to reward un, unwanted behavior. We're not going to reward poor performance after the animal is established that they know the behavior. And if they blow off the handler, like say they run around or they are inappropriate or bark or act crazy, we're going, or in the case of an agility ring, if they do the zoomies and run all over the place and be inappropriate, 
um, they're going to be taken from the course and either put in the car or in a crate or it's just a doggy timeout. So how do we get, as trainers, how do we get from an untrained dog to a dog that walks on a loose leash, sits down, stands, comes when called, and does stay? We start by shaping their behavior. And in Hennepin County, our first class with our beginner dogs is, or with our beginner team, is held without any dogs. Um, we hold it at TCOTC, which is a large facility. They have a meeting room and whatever, and agility rings and all sorts of neat stuff. But we ask for a volunteer to you who's going to help us demonstrate shaping behavior. And what we do is we ask that volunteer to go into an isolated area where they can't see anything. And we typically go into the obedience, or excuse me, in the agility ring. And we put like a small candy bar or a pack of gum or something tangible. And we hide it. And then we bring the person in and typically we have them stand as far away from the item as we can get them. And any of you who've played hot and cold, um, this, this is the game. The people, the rest of the class know where the item is and they say hot or cold, or usually we, they would just have them say hot as they person gets closer and closer to what the item is and it's interesting all of a sudden you see all these little white light bulbs go off in their heads going ah and they realize that the further away when they're shaping the fur the earlier they can move towards the desired behavior the faster the result happens is that making sense okay um uh, all right the other thing that we're, the other behavior that we're going to do is called luring. And what we do to lure is we lure into positions. We lure into a sit, we lure into a down. Uh, and what luring is, is basically a carrot and a stick thing. Some people use a dollar bill and have somebody follow a dollar bill around. A lure is just like a lure. It's something you want to do. Oh, the video is not working. Heavens. No, it, 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 it some people it's Okay. Because my audio has been kind of iffy all day. Um, another thing that we, there are a couple things that we do stress in orientation, which I think may be useful to other people as well. Uh, once we stress during and through and throughout the training process, is that to keep your dog on a short leash near you and that every dog has a bubble. And I, this was kind of alluded to in other sessions, mm -hmm. but the bubble is every animal has a bubble. Every dog has a bubble. Some it's large, some it's small, but we have to respect that. And with COVID, everybody has at least a six foot bubble. So wow. that kind of been in helpful. And also we prohibit Flexi leads. They tend to break at the worst possible moment. The dog is too far away to be under control. It, uh, again, it's been mentioned throughout this day. It's a safety issue. Flexi leads are great in parks for people who not use them on a trained dog. They're not good for untrained dogs at all. Okay. Uh, for neutral stimuli, mentioned earlier, we tend to use a clicker. A clicker is easy. And ironically, kids are really good at clickers. And they possibly from all of their video game work, but they're really good about clicking and they have the timing down a, a lot better than most adults do. And for paired rewards, there are three primary rewards, uh, water, food, and sex. Water, every animal needs to have water continually. Uh, sex is outside of our realm for the 
And so we're, we're going to be using food. And that's just a quick, bam, it facilitates the process significantly. We're ultimately going to weed away from food and go into secondary reinforcement, which would be praise, petting, and some dogs like toys. That works. We need to establish low value food, low value treats, medium value treats, high value treats. Soft food is great. Initially, I'm particularly fond of using string cheese and soft pounce cat treats. And there are lots and lots of others. Bill Jack, tons of options. Um, some people use Cheerios. Cheerios are good. Um, they're not soft, but especially if you have a, a dog like a Corgi or a small dog, they're very low calorie. And you can cheat and mix some of the dog's kibble with the cheese and the hot dogs and it absorbs some of the flavor, apparently. I don't know. I haven't eaten it. Peanut butter is good. Again, with allergies and things, you'll want to check and see if anybody in your class has got allergies. Uh, one thing about working, training in the summer is you have to be use food safety. If you're outside and you've got your hands in the, with the meat and the cheese and the whatever, at the end of the day, just throw it away. Okay, uh, how we start the process is after the food is cut into small pieces, we prime the clicker. And what we do, is the clickers our neutral stimuli or our noise, which is a, a unique noise. Pop for people, different people have different noises. And you make the noise and you treat. You make the noise and you treat. You make the noise and you treat. And so the dog starts to associate the noise with the snack. And every time that noise is made, you must treat the dog. You've made a contract with the dog. You can't, you can't violate that contract or it's gone. One helpful hint, if you're a, a, a tall person or whatever, and you're training a small dog, you can use uh, wooden spoons and dip it in peanut butter. Dip the handle of the spoon in peanut butter and let the dog lick. So you don't have to bend over all the time. Again, with the, the caveats about uh, peanut butter allergies or peanut allergies. One thing you've got to tell the kids to be aware of is what's um, called dog trainer's pocket, where somebody leaves a treat in their pocket and the dog eats the pocket when you leave your jacket not hung up. Okay. So what we have people, the, the kids do in between the first session without their dogs and the first class is we have them practice clicker exercises. And what we do is we have them um, watch TV or do something. And every time, say, a certain word is used, they click. Every time uh, they drop different things on the floor, when it hits the floor, they click. They have to pick them up. But just different different practicing, different different timing. They just have, they have to condition their response. Okay, say so I'm going to stop or I'm going to jump in here. What we really need to start talking about are, are, are the changes that have been done to the show or to the obedience guidelines and then go into I know that um, the people had specific questions and, and then maybe tough. we can cover more of the of this at the end of our session so we can make sure that we get um, because there were some changes made and then um, we're getting to the Jessica, cons. I think you have the list of the different things people had said they wanted to know, right? Yeah, it's right here. Okay. All right. So, um, Judy, do you have the uh, changes in front of you to go over? Or? Well, we're going to get to the different ways to get the, to present the behaviors. Well, uh, um, I think we need to get first, we need to talk about the changes that have been made okay. to the obedience guidelines and whatever. And then at the end, we can talk more about behaviors. And we did have people that had specific questions that they had sent to us. So, um, right. and those are all addressed. So, those will all be addressed. Uh, 
Okay. okay. We need to do those first though. So let's yeah. start with they, the those need to go be done first. We need to talk about mm -hmm. the changes. We need to talk about the questions that people had, and then we can go back into the behaviors. Okay. All right. Um, well, the rule changes, the major rule change that we made since the last time was we added the cones and that was two years ago. So we just beat the COVID thing. And all that is is instead we don't need of, to do anything. Um, COVID was co was covered this morning, so no. What, what I'm saying is we beat COVID. We put the cones in before we before COVID hit, so we're good. We were ahead of ourselves, is what no, I said. No, we haven't. No, no, we need to talk about the cones. The cones. And no. The cones. Yeah, so Okay, so what happened is that we replaced the post. The main things that were changed was that in the figure eight exercise, the cones replace the post. So right. this was done in 2019. Um, right. And basically there will be no human beings in the ring anymore for post. It will all right. be cones. Yeah. Okay. But Judy, we haven't explained that to anybody. We haven't had a show since this went into effect. That's why we need to explain it now. And that was what I was getting towards. <laughs> I truly was. Okay, let's... Okay. Sorry, everybody, this is just... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so our first night of class, we, we space everybody out, we have a bubble. And I think one of the biggest problems in the olden days was when we took our dogs off leash, they disappeared. And I saw that on a couple of comments on the sheet is how do you get from on leash healing to off leash healing? Using positive methods, it's not difficult. The dog wants to be with you. You're using treats, you're using positive reinforcement. You're not jerking them around. Um, staying at your side is important to them. They like it. Uh, so it it's very, it's good. It reward the behavior rewards itself. Okay. One um, another thing we need to do is we need, and I think Carl mentioned this in, in the agility section. It's have fun. Smile at your dog. Let them know it's a good thing. Because the dog will pick them up. Then they'll think that you're relaxed and it's good. If you're relaxed, your dog's relaxed. It's very simple. Okay. The first thing that we're going to lure, do is we're going to lure the dog into a sit. And we're going to take a treat. We're going to hold the treat up, bring the treat up above the dog's head. So they're looking at the treat and their rear end goes down. Very simple. When their rear end hits the ground, you click and treat. There are no names given to the behavior. They don't speak English. When the sit is reliably, do a couple sit, take a step forward, do a couple more. Again, click and treat. No names are given to the behavior yet. When the sit is reliably performed, we're using the lure, then add it down. And from a sit, you, you lose lure with the treat, bring the treat down between their front legs, and they lie down. Again, click and treat. Repeat, no names. One thing you're going to, as trainers, you're going to want to teach your kids is release word. And what a release word does is tell the dog that that particular behavior is done. That action is over. Um, some people use release. Some people use free. Unusual words are the best. Words like yes or okay are used in everyday vocabulary. So they can be confusing to our dog. Remind the kids to smile when they're working with their dog. Again, as trainers, you're going to say exercise finished. That tells the kid to tell their dog to release and relax. Uh, again, vary the intervals between the trainer releasing and the kid, the youth releasing. We want the dogs to relax. We don't want them to get overstimulated. 
we want the dogs to maintain engaged but relaxed mood. The play mode is the optimal mode for learning. When we start behavior tra- when we start training, we uh, start a new behavior. We treat every time we do it, every time. As a skill is learned, the frequency of treats decreases. And again, the ultimate goal is to move to secondary reinforcement, which is praise, um, sometimes a treat. Uh, It's called random interval reinforcement. And according to one of my old psych profs, it is the strongest motivator known. Uh, He cited fishing, gambling, and golf as examples of random interval reinforcement behavior. And we know how many people like to do those things. Um, that if you have a dog that's not motivated by food, I see Denise's question here. If your dog is not motivated by food, do they like toys? Do they like a toy? Some, lots of dogs like squishy toys. Some like tug toys. There's got to be a motivator somewhere. And we have to find it. That's part of our job as a trainer. One of the most important skills that people will complain about with their dogs is that they pull. So, in a loose leash walking is not healing. It's just the dog walking in a relaxed at our left side. Uh, and this is usually started in a one on one ratio. The, lo- the youth holds the leash in the right hand with the clicker. The dog's head is even with their left leg. When the dog's head is even with their left leg, they click and treat. Continue walking a step at a time. Every time the dog is in position, click and treat. And this, when they're at home, this is probably one of the best things to practice with the dog's food. Have a, the dog serving a kibble, walk around the yard, walk around the driveway, wherever, click, treat. No name is, again, no name is given to this behavior. The treat is given along the left seam of your pants, and it reinforces the desired behavior. This is loose sleep walking, and we're moving towards healing. And we'll be doing loose leash walking throughout class, except when we're actually doing healing. But that um, won't. I happen. have a question. What if people do not do the clicker training? What um, what can be done instead of clicker training? Um, they can use another. If they don't like a clicker, they can use another word. Just something to a neutral stimulus to inspire, to trigger the reward. Yeah, some people don't like clickers. Some dogs don't like clickers. That's fine. Um, some people, a friend of mine uses boop. She can always say boop. Some people click their tongue. Whatever works. Another thing that the dog is going to be reinforced for, randomly re- reinforced for, is eye contact while loose leash walking. Your dog is going to look at you, you're going to click, and you're going to treat. The dog looks up at your eyes, click, and treat, or noise, and whatever. Another thing that we start on the first week or the first training week is we start laying the foundation for the recall. And we do this often with two people in a small space. like, And we have the dog being called between two different people. Uh, we like the dog to be happy. We like them to be their tail to be wagging. We want it to be a positive experience. If the dog decides that it wants to go explore, then we put them on a long line. And sometimes we just start them on a long line just because. Uh, there's lots of praise. If the dog doesn't come the first time they're called, you can slap your legs, you can make a funny noise. You cannot call the dog more than once. Okay, we have a question. It okay. says, I have a dog that totally has no motivation for any toy or treat. We tried a new toy treat each week or they did at home <laughs> and nothing worked. Ideas. Yikes. What kind of dog is it? Erica, what kind of dog? Yeah. Huh? A golden? Oh my gosh. It's a golden retriever, two years old, zero motivation. We tried happy voices, new treats, everything we could think of, and nothing. We even tried it chasing another dog, and it didn't work. Wow. No. Does he have anything that he likes? Sorry, what? Is there anything that he likes? 
that he likes. No, yeah. it's just a really lazy, playful, on his own terms, doesn't care about anything you try, golden retriever. Oh. It might not be happy pills. Happy pills? <laughs> yeah, man. Is it overweight at all? No, it, it was, it's a two-year-old golden retriever. Um, wow. Very happy very dog, like just not, I mean, the kid was motivated. I mean, it. she she overtried so hard to get this dog to do anything. And it just wouldn't do anything. Like I said, we tried new treats, new toys. Um, I have great bait, which is pressed liver that pretty much every dog loves. And every dog, dog loves liver. This dog <laughs> hated it. It just would not do anything. And she would just get so frustrated, but she was oh, a yeah. and kept working. I just, I don't, and I don't, she hasn't come back to the program yet. Okay. I see Nicole's comments. And that's mine also. Does What does the dog eat for treats at home? It doesn't. Anything. It, it just doesn't? eats his dog food. Hmm. I know. Well, I would be using the dog food as treat then. Maybe we should go that route. Yeah. Okay. Or but scent. I, scent is I good. I tried to, you know, get find that special treat for training to make them more motivated, but I just I ran out of ideas with this dog. Yeah. I've heard some people for their really picky dogs, they use like ro rotisserie chicken. Oh, they tried dog. it. They tried it. That didn't work. No, nope. these parents were so willing to try anything. Um, fresh chicken, bacon, caught oh dogs, gosh. cheese, pressed, um, the great bait liver, um, dog treats from the store. I mean, they would come literally with a basket of things just oh to gosh. see if and try something every time and just no motivation. That's so atypical for Golden. I know. It was happy it was healthy it wasn't overweight it was two so it should be very energetic yeah I just somebody mentioned early checking their thyroid that would be my first thought oh okay awesome thank you yeah 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 because uh, goldens are the reason they're great obedience dogs is they'll do something 200 times because you want to do it and they love food which makes them really easy to train. So odd. Yeah, have, suggest maybe talking to their practitioner and having their thyroid check. Because I think that might, that might do the trick for them. That's not a typical symptom of a thyroid issue. And the fact that she says the dog is not overweight, that's the first sign of a thyroid issue in a dog. Um, we had a dog like that, and when we stopped trying to give him treats and motivate him with toys and everything else and worked faster with him, he became much more excited and interested in it. But the slower we worked with him, oh, he yeah. just slow wasn't not involved at all. Okay. Or not even slow. It's not slow, just normal pace. Just everything had to be fast. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. And <laughs> moving constantly, and he he did finally pick everything up. I had a dog with thyroid issue and she was not overweight one bit. She was just very moody. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm thinking of something hormonal. Oh, that's children. But. All right, I'll reach out to the family. I appreciate all the ideas and suggestions. Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's just so atypical for what you're presenting. Yeah, okay. Well, let us know. Okay, um, let's think. One thing about... The recall is a lot of people call their dog and then do something the dog doesn't like. They clip their toenails, they give them a bath, they take them to the vet. So the dog starts to associate unpleasantness with the word come. So then we have to find a new word. Um, some pers some people say here, uh, front for recalls, but they just save that one for recalls. Just think of a new word. And only use that word when you are positive and you want to, the dog to come to you. If you have to do something adversive in the dog's eyes, go get the dog. Again, if uh, call once, if the dog isn't making attention, make a noise, flap your thighs, always smile. And don't, don't beg your dog. Just, and don't nag them either. 
One thing that we found in the switch to positive methods is that not only the dogs more resilient, but the kids seem to be more resilient also. It's not doing something perfectly is not a failure. It just didn't go the way you wanted the first time. You can do it again. And the resilience is very nice to see because it used to, in the olden days, back in the 90s, when I, we were t I started teaching 4-H using the older methods, if it didn't go right, kids would shut down. They'd I don't think we need to talk about the olden days. We need to talk about what's happening now. And we do have a question about okay. how... How can we start training scent articles? We have a member that is starting graduate open this year, and this is the first time in years we've had someone this high. Okay. And I think that's what we need to concentrate on are the questions that the people have so that we can make sure we're really touching on those aspects. Okay. So. All right. <clears throat> scent articles are a continuation of targets. Do you have the articles? Does your person have the articles? As far as I know, they do. Okay. Uh, what they're going to want to do is they're going to want to scent them, which means they hold them in their hand and they rub them. And this is after, of course, building a foundation in scent. You scent. You can, ha you can start by getting canning lids, putting scent on them, rubbing them with your hand, putting them on a target art article or a tile or something. And you have a couple of tiles down and you have a couple of lids on each of those. You use, uh, what are they called? Tongs to place the ones. Uh, you're smiling, Marlene. Um, to, to place the unscented lids on or have somebody else place them. And the dog sniffs when he alerts on your article, you give lots of treats. You get solid with this, which means that you have an 80% or greater success rate. And you start with an article. Again, you have a scented article and then you have your unscented articles. And the scented articles are kept separate. Um, some people run them through the dishwasher. Other people do different things. Some people just air them out. It depends. The dogs can pick up a fresh scent. They're very, very, very good at that. So what you do is that's how you start. And you build on that. And grad open, I believe, they only have three of each rather than the whole set of six of each. If I remember correctly. And that's where you go. You start, you get, you get reliable, and you don't do it a lot. But do you have any questions, yeah. Denise? Does that work for you? Yes. Does that answer the question? Yes. OK. Do you have any questions? And there is videos out there as well um, mm -hmm. that Alex put out. Alex, some of you don't know. I keep referring to Alex, but Alex um, put videos out there and she is a member of the PDC that um, was un unable to be with us today because she was actually getting married. So <laughs> um, her videos are out there of they the are. templates and the other tools and then um, starting that scent work. So, um, and if you have any questions on those videos, um, Marlene gave her email, contact Marlene and we will get a hold of Alex um, to reiterate and answer those questions for you on those. So. Okay. Um, how is the dog's dumbbell work? So I think you were the one that says how to hold the, how to get the dog to hold the dumbbell. Yep. Dumb, this, dumbbell, I think, was one of the other questions that people had. So right. Um, I don't know if I can do this, but there is on the share drive. Where are we here? For some reason, my computer won't let me pull up. Well, and I don't think we need to pull up videos today. That's why the links were set out to the people for them to look at. Okay. So today is more of a 
uh, discussion and telling the what our new uh, changes have been for obedience and then answering questions that people had sent in. Um, right. Well, we did the, the new rules two years ago. So um, we're doing for the dumbbell. We had the addendums. Um, addendums came out in 2019, which... Right. Um, or no, they changed actually in 2020. And so we need right. to go over those so everybody is aware of them. Right. And we will. We have plenty of time. Um, uh, I think we need to do that right now. Um, okay. And then we can continue on with the other things. So. All right, let's pull it Because the addendums, um, and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the rest of the committee, I think they're very important that we get out to the people. Okay. Yeah. I have yes. the list in front of me. Do you just run down it? Yeah, I've got the list all copied out. Thank you. Okay, well, let's start with the addendums then. Okay, let me pull those up for us. Waste. Oh, it's the exer the figure eight exercises using the cones. We did that. No, we did not. No, do we that. haven't. Yes, we will. The we figure started eight. it, but we haven't really gone through it. We need to really explain it. Okay, the figure eight is just using cones instead of the post. They're paced eight feet apart. The person faces the judge or whomever is evaluating them, the trainer in the beginning. And they will, they start approximately 12 to 18 feet behind. You can go either direction when you start. And I prefer to start to the left because that way if my dog is forging, I can get them back into position. And when you're doing it, when you're on the outside, you take a longer step. When your dog is on the outside, you take a shorter step. The tempo of the figure eight never changes, the, which means the beat of it never changes. Does okay, but sense? regarding the cones, there are some uh, recommendations for the cones. Yep, so the suggested height of the cones should be 28 inches high. Um, the cones should be no shorter than 12 inches and no taller than 36 inches. The cones should be made of solid plastic or rigid vinyl, which is very similar to the highway cones. Mm -hmm. um, so at the state dog show, the cones will be that 28 inch height. They have already okay. been purchased. They were ready to go. Um, and then COVID. <laughs> so um, we allowed... Uh, that uh, range of cones, just because of the fact that um, we know counties have their rally cones, um, which is like that 12 inch height available. We didn't want counties to go out and spend a whole lot of money on, on cones if they didn't have them until they were able to purchase them. Um, so there's lots of different things um, th that you can do. Um, or you know what, ask highway department if they're getting rid of cones. And if that, if, I mean, that's an easy, easy way to do it. Um, but the main reason we, we replaced the post, the human post with a cone is because of the fact, um, A for time, because of the fact that, um, you know, a lot of people are wanting to watch their kids and not willing to volunteer and stuff like that and trying to find two people to get in the ring, then, you know, that's tough. So, um, that's the reason why we did it for time, for time to keep things flowing, especially at the state show, because of the fact that, you know, it's a lot, you need a lot of volunteers for the amount of rings that we run. So, mm -hmm. um, and then the other reason was, was because of the fact that not all the time can you get the same person to work the whole or the whole class. So if we remove those humans out of there, that takes away the scent that, um, they may have on them. You know, whether, no offense to anybody, but, you know, whether somebody came off the farm or somebody, you know, smokes or somebody has this, this scent or that scent, like, um, the, the figure eight was never a distraction exercise. It has always been the change of pace of the dog. Um, so that's why we took the cones or we took the humans out and replaced them with cones. So does anybody have questions about the cones? Well, I have a comment. You can buy those cones at places like Home Depot, Menards, right. any place like that. And they're they're very reasonably priced. Mm -hmm. um, if you order them online, you pay a huge amount to pay shipping, but um, you can get them easily. Mm -hmm. Okay. 
so that that's the thing about the cones. Um, and then the next addendum or amendment was the age allowance for obedience only. And that was for very similar to what we did in agility, where uh -huh. um, for the dogs that are seven years of age or older, we are allowing them that don't that are healthy but have trouble jumping higher heights. We are allowing them to show in the upper agility classes, but they are going to take advantage of that age allowance and are going to be able to jump the three quarter height. Okay, so in your rule books, there's a reference page on page 73 and 74, okay, that describes this table. Now, if you have a dog that, oh, no, nope, hold on, it's not 73 and 74. Oh, I have a different rule book. Anyways, wherever they describe <laughs> the height, there's a jump height table in there. Um, or maybe I have the wrong ones pulled out. Uh, but anyways, there's a jump. The yeah, 70, 70, 71. And they're not on those pages. Mm -mm. 70 and 71. Oh, yeah. There were many 71. versions of that around. Okay, 70 and 71. Okay. So there's a jump height table. And um, those dogs that are over that age of seven and are just having trouble jumping, but are still healthy to participate in those upper classes that require that jumping, and you don't want to put them in veterans yet, can use that three quarter height table. Now, if they are one of the breeds that is designated to already jump that three quarter height, um, height, jump height, then they are going to move down to half of their height. Okay. Which on the addendum page that is out there, those tables are also out there. Okay. So it has the three quarter jump height and it has the one half jump height table. Okay, um, there was a question. Half of the original height. Um, so yes, so this, is, this isn't, this is when you're measuring the jump height, it is the jump height at the dog's withers. That is different than agility, okay? Uh -huh. When you're jumping in obedience, it is at the dog's wither height, okay? So you have to look to see where that is. So for the high jump and the bar jump, you jump the height of, yeah, the high jump and the bar jump, you jump at their height. For the long jump, that's double the height at their withers. So in actuality, in obedience, they're going to end up jumping higher than what they jump for agility. So they cannot, they will not be the same jump heights unless for some reason they sit right at 12 or, you know, what? well, even that, that wouldn't work anyways, because 12 jumps to eight. So anyways, they will not jump the same height. So you got to make sure that you're practicing the correct jump height for your dogs. Okay. But the main reason we did this was because um, similar to the agility age allowance, the kids are using these dogs throughout their years at the project. So um, we were seeing these aging dogs get to those upper classes and the kids either were having the decision to, um, basically get a new dog or they needed to go into veterans. Um, but some of these kids really wanted to go into these upper levels, but they couldn't do the jumps or their dogs couldn't do the jumps, I should say. They could probably do them just fine, but their dogs couldn't do them. So that's where this age or this new addendum or amendment um, came into um, to help those, those kids out. And the, I guess those dogs out, but those youth that wanted to continue with these older dogs once they got up there. So that's kind of the cones and the age allowance is the biggest things that have changed right. um, in there. Okay. So. And in obedience, if you're doing um, a high jump and a broad jump, the broad jump is always twice the height of the high jump. And if you're um, in the rad open or the utility level, you're doing a high jump and a uh, bar jump, and those are both the same height. Okay. Thank you for covering that. Okay. So, did anybody ha does anybody have any questions about that height or the jump heights or anything? I know the three quarter height 
aspect is different. Um, but like I said, there's a huge, or not huge, but a huge helpful table in the rule book and mm -hmm. on, attached to the ad amendment or addendum that was out there last year. Um, like Marlene said, that was um, just, those addendums were put out last year um, in 2020 before COVID hit. So these aren't, unless you had a show last year, we have not had these up at state yet, or we have not utilized these up at state yet. Um, that was be something that we will have at the state show this year, because it sounds like we're having something in person, but that's when we'll use them. Okay. And, and we have a question. It says, what is the purpose of using cones instead of people? Okay. Um, so I think Jessica covered that. It was Well, but that person that's right. asking might not have been on at that okay. time. Yeah. So um, it's because of the fact that we want to take the distraction away away from um, the exercise. We wanted the exercise to go back to um, what it was before of being able to see the dogs change a pace when the kids are going um, on the different sides of, of the cones, whether the dog's on the inside or whether the dog is on the outside of them. Whereas we're having too much of a problem with, you know, not having enough volunteers and then the distraction of the different scents, um, you know, sometimes you'd have to use a, you know, a younger kid where they didn't stand still or, you know, somehow they'd want to watch the dog and, you know, all those types of things. So we, we try to implement the cones in there to take all that away, um, basically to speed up shows and um, to make it more fair across the board um, for all the youth involved. And I mean, we did think of the possibility that a dog may want to play with a cone. They may think that it's the play toy, but that comes down to training. Um, all the training aspects of it um, can be done. And no, don't apologize for not being here for that discussion part. It, that is perfectly fine. Um, it happens. We understand people are jumping in and out of this. Oh, so, yeah. um, so that covers the amendment. So does anybody have any questions about any of the amendments or the rules that have been updated? Yes. The, okay. <clears throat> the age allowance is the same as the one that goes into the agility, correct? No, they are different. Mm -hmm. They are different. Okay. So there, and that's where you need to know the difference between your agility and your obedience. Your agility, age allowance is you jump, that's totally separate when it comes to that. The key is still that the dog has to be seven and is healthy enough to jump and still wants to jump, okay? But we are allowing, the overall aspect of it is the same because we're allowing um, the dogs to jump at a lower height. However, that height that they're jumping is figured differently between agility and obedience. Does that make right. sense? Right, mm -hmm. no, what I was getting at was because if they, the age allowance in obedience allows them to be able to continue to show in agility using the age allowance because before they had to go into the veterans class if they couldn't, you know, if they were having trouble jumping. Right? Yes. Yeah. They had to go into the veterans class and then that eliminated them from any jumping class. Correct. Yes. Okay. So this is preventing them from having to go into that veterans class if they are still capable of at least jumping that three quarter height or that half if they are on the three quarter height list already. Does that kind of cover it? I don't know who's asking the question, so sorry. It's me, the past. <laughs> okay. um, yeah, no, that, that explained it. I was just trying to clarify that they were somewhat related to each other and that's why mm -hmm. they were implemented together correct and that and that that is the thing i mean they they basically mm -hmm. they are for that they were implemented together so we hope that kids continue with the same dog and don't have to get a new dog um but can continue in those upper classes so they are similar and they were created for the same thing um but the yeah the height differences is different so and definitely reach out to any of us if you have any questions 
I mean, we totally understand that, you know, there's so much to know the difference between this. Um, and we get it. I mean, and don't get us wrong. We, we still go back and read all of our rule books. I mean, I don't even know how many rule books I have, um, that are scattered all over pieces all over. Um, I totally, before this seminar, I honestly made my extension educator or asked my extension educator to print total new ones. It's just so I could have them to reference. So, um, we get it. Um, so as long as there's, um, no other questions on those two new things. That's the newest thing, newest things. Okay. All right. Um, let's see. Somebody asked about if we could get our rules in line with the AKC obedience and rally rules. We took most of our stuff from the old AKC rules. Uh, the AKC has since amended their rules and we haven't followed suit yet. I think we will do that ultimately, but not right now. And, and that's on the docket for the PDC. Um, however, we are trying to get the showmanship. We, we rotate through the different aspects that gets updated. So we mm -hmm. are currently working on the showmanship aspects right now. And just so everybody knows, as the PDC, we'll work, get the showmanship ones done. And then we will be going to the rally ones. I believe the rally is due next to be updated. So that's when those will come into play. So know that we know that other venues are changing. We know that the rules are changing. We know that they've changed things. And unless we find it a huge safety thing, um, like the shoot was, we're not going to per se implement it right away. Um, there's a process that we go through, um, or, or I should say a rotation that it goes through. We're getting there. Um, we can only do so much a year. And the Another process is said, long and, and arduous. So it's yeah. and lots PDC, and lots of time. PDC only has about 10 people. And when you get a committee to do the rule changes, you have about four or five people where the outside venues have a whole group of people who do each venue and they can dedicate that time. We don't have that much time with the limited people we have. Okay. No, no, and I, I think our next, what the AKC has done with obedience is they've made it safer for the group days. But um, again, that's what, two years down the road if we're lucky. Okay. Um, and just so you guys know too, like us as a PDC and all the committees that subcommittees that work, um, we do realize that we are a youth organization and that's our hugest aspect that we are trying to remember we are also trying to remember that um, we have a lot, a lot, a lot of rural counties that don't have access to huge training facilities or the inner city stuff that is offered. Um, and then that we are truly ran by volunteers. Um, so that's the stuff. huge part of it um, that we know that you guys can't tra travel um, to get to a training facility or to do anything like that. So. Um, we're keeping that in mind as well. So that's, that's what we're doing here. So if you, and if you ever have any recommendations or anything you, you know, want us to hit, take into consideration, please contact one of us or, um, you know, just so we can get it, you know, think through it. We, we don't think of everything we try, but we don't think of everything. Um, so let us know, or if there's something in particular in your county that's happening or your area or whatnot, let us know. We can't think of everything. So, or, also, or even take new members. Oh, I, oh, I yeah. was just, I was just going to say what Loretta said. We're, we're always looking for new members. So if you're, if you, <laughs> if you ah, want to change subtle. rules, you know, we're open to people helping okay. or update let yeah. us know come join <laughs> we're a great group to work with we have a lot of fun okay. um so i guess the next thing on our list was how to socialize the dog and attention okay we're gonna we'll get to that um the drop on recall and the signal exercises are actually the foundations for those are laid in the first set of classes um the signal exercise you should be able to do that definitely by the time you hit red beginner and it's fun it the dog's like it the kids like it it's a 
it's a crowd pleaser and it's very easy to teach. The drop on recall is a little more of a challenge. Um, you're going to start laying the foundation for that in the novice rally level where you're walking and you're down your dog. And you, it's a repetitive thing. You walk, you drop your dog and you build on that. Sometimes you will leave your dog and step away, turn and call. And you'll drop your dog from a distance. You'll stand in front of your dog when the dog is in a sitting position. You'll turn, you'll drop your dog, you'll call your dog. It's a lot of different steps. The regular, the, or the simple recall exercise is actually four different exercises put together. There's the sit and wait, there's the call, there's the front, and there's the finish. Each of them are talked separately and you don't have to do them all together at the same time. And in fact, it's highly recommended you don't do them all together. You can do the call and you can make that fun. You do, we do the two people call to start with the beginners. We have the kids on a long line and we put the dog on a long line. We have the kid go say 10 feet, 15 feet of a 30 foot area. We have them go halfway turn, call their dog, turn and run. This is a safety thing. You have to make sure you don't have any dogs with a really high prey drive around. You have to know the dogs in your class. If you've got a dog with a high prey drive, you can have that dog someplace else. Uh, if you know the dogs, you can do it as, and always do this individually, not as a group charge. It's fun. It gets a really nice snappy recall out of your dog. Okay. The jumps. Uh, never. People who compete never jump the full height of the dog. Um, there's a training level of the dumbbell, the retrieve of the dumbbell on the a YouTube channel with a little brown and white dog. It is the first time that dog has ever done the dumbbell retrieve. That is the first time the dog has ever retrieved over a fence. So you guys are getting the first time look. The jump is only eight inches high. We want to make it as pleasant as possible for the dog. And the broad jump, when you start the broad jump, uh, ultimately you're going to end up, the broad jump is, in, is an open, and you're going to originally leave the dog, walk past the broad jump and call them over the, the jump. Ultimately, you're going to turn and you're going to be standing on the left side of the broad jump, facing the broad jump. So there's a lot of steps there that you have to get to. Um, that shows up, I believe, in, that's in pre-open and open. So no, it's, uh, Brad and I are going to start with the recall for the high five. And then in pre-open, it goes up to the actual broad jump. Right. It shows up so in pre-open. You are starting with, with the recall over the broad jump in grad novice. Okay. Oh, that was, oh, anyway. Okay. Uh, the high jump shows up in grad novice and the with the dumbbell, which is a challenge. Um, you want, there is a thing, there are a couple different videos of the dog learning how to take the dumbbell and hold it. And there are exercises you can do early in the training and beginners and to get the dog to hold something in its mouth and to give something where you put your hand underneath and the dog drops it. Uh, we found that dogs that have been used with adversive conditioning like ear pinches or toe steps or whatever, it's hard to get them to hold the dumbbell. They'll no, spin. it's not. Okay. Oh, this is really poor. 
Okay, we're just going to move on to the, the list, Judy. I'm just going to read off the list and see if people have questions. Um, how do you, um, how do, uh, does anybody have any questions of how to socialize their dog or do like attention type exercises? Hot dog exercises are attention exercises where the dog right. looks in your, your face. But I'm asking every, the people who are on. Okay. Um, to ask their specific questions of you know what they what questions they have arising for socializing dogs and i guess i guess i, I we can just I, I actually have a question around that because typically in a normal year i would suggest covid has presented a lot of challenges to socializing yeah. dogs and typically I would recommend that they take their dog to the store with them. Mm -hmm. how, so how can, especially the shy dogs, I would have them take them to the store and, and have people give them their dogs treats. What can be done now? So with, um, in my opinion, with how COVID has progressed, with how much we are opening up, they can honestly still go to the store um, and have people give them treats. Remember, we're supposed to be six feet away and socially distanced, but that 15 minute time frame. and Renee, correct, correct me if I'm wrong, but that 15 minute, it's that 15 minutes of non-socially distant. You can have somebody, um, you know, help you socialize your dog in less than 15 minutes. Uh -huh. You're going to be masked. You're going to be by each other. Um, yes, there's going to be some interaction, but that little bit of mingling is, you can still do it cautiously, in my opinion. You know, you you can use hand sanitizer afterwards. Like I said, you're going to be masked. Um, and like Renee was saying earlier, you know, they're not finding that it stays in, stays on surfaces. So if they pet, they're petting your dog and stuff like that, I don't foresee that being a problem. Um, do it outside. Um, you know, it, it. You know, we're finding that you know being outside isn't as bad as being inside. So go outside. Um, you know, we still do a little bit. Yes, we still take into the six feet of consideration, but we still do a little bit of socialization at the beginning of our classes. Everybody's on a short leash. You're kind of walking like you're in a crowd. Everybody's dog has to be paying attention to them. And everybody's dog, um, you know, allows people to, to, to talk to each other. It's very similar to the canine good citizen test where, you know, you have a person walking by you um, where, I can't remember off the top of my head exactly, but um, you have to meet a person and you have to sit, your dog has to sit nicely and then you have to proceed on. Like, so you can still do a lot of those things and that's still socializing your dogs. Um, and that's still being allowed to keep that six foot feet ish, -ish difference, um, but still keeping everybody safe. But like I said, you're still having those dogs by each other. Okay, and still within each other. And they're, you know, they're, they can still socialize being that six feet apart if you're really, really going to keep that six feet apart. Okay. Um, if you have a really shy dog, you can accomplish a lot on your own. If you walk to a different place every day, they get used to things being different. There's not that consistency of this is familiar uh -huh. place. This is Every place that's new brings them a new challenge and they grow and they get through that that's fear a, of new things on their th own. That's and a good huge, idea. And a huge thing is not reacting fearfully. Just kind of look at a new stimulus and move on. Don't reinforce the dog's fear. Question. No. Question. Yes. You're talk are you talking socializing as in the dog being letting other people pet it and touch it such like that or socializing as in being around other dogs without an issue it should be both when you okay. socialize the dog you're socializing it for people you're socializing it for do um, other dogs and you're socializing it across the board in environments um okay. your dog should be with a, a team a pair with you and that dog should be able to lean on you and know that like you're not going to put it ever in a situation where it's going to be harmed. Okay. Um, so like Loretta was saying with it, um, you know, training in different environments, we did that a lot when we were younger. My mom would bring us to different parks all the time. 
and have us train there to get the dogs used to it because that was when invitationals were very, very common. And that's the same thing with the state dog show. You know, most of these only train at their county or in their county venues. Well, when you go to state, you have a whole different environment. So the more you can get your dog out to not only train with people around, to not only train with other dogs around, but to train in different environments, the more aspects you cover those socialization, the better. Okay. Also, uh, so I, I, think, I think that way too, you won't have the kids come to training and go, but he does it so well at home. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And that's what you hear often. Well, he does it well at home. Well, that's because home is a safe place. So you need to get, take them out and socialize them and get them so they feel comfortable in all different environments. Mm-hmm. You we also have to be in careful our when you praise them because to a dog it, that's scared and you're praising them for being scared, that's your reward. Enforcing. You can talk to them and say, hey, it's fine, I'm right here, but don't get excited and say, you're a good boy, you're a good boy because don't that is the, the reward behavior. for the bad behavior. Exactly. Okay, you've mentioned the fearful dog and I yeah. understand understand that what do you do when you have a dog that is extremely protective of the person and that's has resource a, guarding what that's called resource guarding the person is their resource right uh, and, it, and it, what mm-hmm. i'm asking is they get very and they have like a bubble around you you know or whatever <laughs> and if somebody particularly a dog enters that space they get um, they aggressive. Pro- they protect you because they feel that you can't protect them. You need to become more of the leader and let them know that you are capable of protecting them and taking care of them. Um, that I, I work with dangerous dogs, registered dangerous dogs. Yep. Um, and so this is what we have to do. And, you have to establish that you are the alpha. Really simple steps that you can do for that. Um, For one thing, they don't get fed until they've done something. So they have to sit and stay, they have to come, they have to do something. If they don't do it, you put the food up. You can try it again in 15 minutes. But that, if you look at, at alpha dogs, they eat first. If you look at a wolf, Um, And a lot of research research has been done on this. The wolf, the alpha eats first. They eat the best food. The one that's not the alpha gets whatever is left over. So you always eat before your dog. You, if they don't do what you tell them, they don't eat. You go through the door before them because the alpha always gets the best through whatever. They get to go where they want. if your dog is laying down, you push them out of the way. And it doesn't have to be mean, but if you, if they're laying in the middle of the floor and you have to walk around them, they're showing that they're in charge. So you go up and you just push them out of the way. That's establishing that you are the boss. By being the boss, you'll take care of them. So those are some of the simple things. There's other things. Um, when you pet your dog, you can't give them long strokes to pet them. That's saying, I love you, I love you, I'll do anything for you, just like mom did when they were a puppy. So it's pats, pat on the head, pat on the chest, um, not any of those long strokes to, to show mm-hmm. them that they are your world. Okay. There's those a question. Are some that, of the simple things. A question came through about liability issues about a dog that nips, and you take them to the store and the dog nips someone. Um, that's covered under your homeowner's insurance, right? It depends on what kind of breed that you have. There is a list of breeds of dogs that homeowner insurers do not like to cover. So it depends on what, what the breed is, but anytime a dog's teeth hit human skin, there is a liability issue. It doesn't um, even have to be your skin. It can be your clothes. Mm-hmm. If it nips at you and has contact with any part of your being, that You're is in included as a bite. Yep. Not a, a break of skin or blood or anything. It is 
he's touching a part of you. Mm -hmm. So that would be something you would want to work with a tr uh, personal trainer on. Uh, and I, I'll email you or whatever. But yeah, that would be a dog I would, if I took it out in public, I would put it in a muzzle. And there's nothing wrong with muzzles. Muzzles often comfort an insecure dog. And there's a lot of part, a lot of education about a dog in a muzzle is not a dangerous dog. It's not a bad dog. It's just a dog that needs or wants to, to do that. And I think it's, they're very common in Europe. I think it would be a good thing if we get them more common in the States again. Okay, um, let's move on. Um, Jessica, what else is on that list of questions that people had sent in um, at the beginning? Uh, okay, so about a month um, or so ago. We already touched on the touch plates and the other tools um, a little bit. Um, so, and that's something that, like I said, Alex put really good movies, or not movies, videos, movies, whatever you want to call them, I guess. Short mm -hmm. movies, I don't know, out there. Um, that she did a really good job presenting those. So definitely, you know, go take a look at those and let us know if you have any questions. Um, so I guess the next topic is the basic healing. Okay, and um, I'm going to get to that. Both on leash and off leash. So I guess overall, does anybody have any in particular questions um, for on leash or off leash healing that they want to ask us? Okay. Um, um, as far as the um, pacing of it, mm -hmm. is the dog supposed to be adjusting to the handler or is the handler to, to be adjusting to the dog? No, the handler, dog, the the handler stays at the same speed. Yes. Okay. The dog has to adjust their speed. So on the fast time, I mean, obviously, yes, the handler is going to jog a little bit or, you know, walk fast, but the judge is looking for that change in speed of the dog. You're talking when they're first starting. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when we're looking at when they're first starting, you know, mm -hmm. like just learning how to heal, yep. to, should um, the handler be trying to adjust to the, quote, the dog's normal no, no. Gate. the dog adjusts the handler always. No, you should always be encouraging the dog to adjust to adjust to the handler. So if that handler is walking slower than the dog, then the dog needs to be reminded where heel position is and be told easy and brought back to that position. Okay, so that dog needs to adjust, and this comes with the fact that you need to you need to prove to the dog that you're in charge. You the dog needs to obey what your body language and what you are asking of them. So you need to remind them, no easy, no heel. Um, or I shouldn't say no easy, it's easy. And remind them no heel. They need to be, they need to know where that heel position is. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so they, the dog should always be adjusting to their speed, especially in the figure eight. That's where you are, the judge is looking for it in particular. They're looking for that dog to start trotting when the dog is on that outside of that figure eight. And then that dog, they're looking for that dog to slow down on its yeah. own. Yeah. Um, Cause that human, the, the youth should be walking the same speed oh. on the outside of that figure eight mm -hmm. as they are on the inside of that figure eight. The tempo is the same. The, the okay. feet are the same. The footsteps I should say. Okay, um, my daughter had the question of, how do you do with, deal with the, um, the dog that has the parent as the alpha and getting that transferred to the member being, you know, like above the dog at least. The child always feeds the dog. Yeah, that's the number one rule. Because whoever feeds the dog controls its life. Yep. So the the child the youth needs to take over, um, taking care of the dog. Okay. Yeah, 
<laughs> ideally we want them to do a lot of the stuff but food is the most important yeah one. exactly exactly and the primary during training that parent should be present that youth has to start training that dog that they're in charge and they don't need to focus on that parent and it's it is tough it is very tough but it's either that or you're going to have parents hiding parents that can't ever watch their kids you need to train that dog and youth that that parent can be in the ring and that dog can obey and listen to that handler regardless of that other human or that other parent being present so and you hiding, train oh go ahead Loretta. hiding never works because dogs rely on noses not eyesight so mm -hmm. they know the parent is there so hiding does nothing. The only thing they can do that might work would be to not even drive the child to the fair to watch, to, to exhibit. So that's really not very realistic. Um, the other thing is the parent should stand close to the fence so the dog can see them, but they should cross their arms because to a dog, body language is everything and crossing your arms means stay away from me. So if you stand there as the parent with your arms folded in front of you, the dog looks at you and says, oh, I want to go over there. Oh, no, you don't want me there. And then they learn to focus on that youth. And they don't give any of the, any of the corrections to the dog. They literally come, they sit, they stand there, and it's always in the same spot because they, the dog can get used to them being in that same spot, and they're fine. Um. Hmm. So the less that the adult can, you know, they're present, yes, but yet they're allowing the youth to do all of the training and all the corrections. And like, I, like Loretta said, feeding is huge. Um, we had a question in the chat that says, does, do they have to heal on the left? In obedience, always. the heal is always on the left. They always work off the left side in obedience. I have Dog. seen an exception for that. I don't remember what it was, but the youth had a problem physically. Oh. And That's so there can situation. be an exception, but it is absolutely the exception. Yep. Yeah. So most all healing, unless there's a major exception, is done on the left. Okay. Um, I believe that so goes ties back to the hunting aspect of it because most people are right-handed yep. so they're going to be carrying a firearm in their right hand yep. and shooting from the right side so then that way the dog and the firearm are on opposite sides correct right? yep. mm -hmm. and the yep. shells eject to the right and so it doesn't hit the dog and the, huh. the noise is a little bit quieter um, and they have a better line of sight Oh, interesting. That, and when you're training farm animals, those animals are always on your right. So your dog is always on the left. Yep. yep. We talk about up here. One other thing on the, uh, the parents and alpha and all that other fun stuff um, that, that we, that I, I know has been said before, if a parent is there, the dog knows the parent is sitting in that chair and and is right there to get up and run behind a barricade just because your dog is going out into the ring or your kid is going into the ring. Um, all of a sudden that dog is going where they go, where they go. And so it's, even if they're not at trainings all the time or can't be at trainings all the time, I really um, found that the last year we had, or, you know, two years ago, I finally told my dad told told the father, it's like, you stay there, don't move because Cody always has problems because he's watching for you and you get up and move. And I said, let's give it a try and see. And so, yeah, Cody continued to listen to Wyatt because, and he checked in with dad, but like you said, I, I said, you pulled your arms and dad sat there and we, we had less problems than we'd ever had. So okay. it really not, you know, even if the parents can't be there every week or even occasionally just don't get up and run and try to hide because oh, no. that's the worst thing you can honestly do. Yep. So, 
And, and that's the most common, not really mistake, but common thing that all of us trainers are going to deal with all the time, all the time. Yes. Um, so the more you can work with that at training, every training, the better it's going to be, once, especially once it gets to show day. Um, and that's where your mock shows come in handy as well, because then, you know, at your mock shows or your in-county workshops, you can correct that while they're in the ring without getting points deducted. Okay. Um, even if you are at invitational, if some of you are actually having invitationals, I always have the kids, you know, yes, it's an invitational, but you want the dogs to know that they have to listen to you in the ring. So take those deductions now. So hopefully at County, you don't have to have them. Okay. So just remember that. Um, so basic healing, um, you know, on leash. And then remember the grab beginner, you um, have it o the, it over the shoulder, um, which is a step towards the off leash healing. Um, so that's, remember it's over your shoulder, but you can't hang on to it. Um, mm -hmm. And then, like I said, that's, that's, the, that's the step be before novice where they actually go off leash. Uh -huh. um, off leash healing wise, there's lots and lots of different ways that you can train it. Um, I mean, a lot of that is just a pretending like they're still on leash. The dog can sense when you, um, are nervous, you're worried about them going away. Um, so the more you can act like they are still on leash, the better. Um, so you keep your same walking spe speed because a lot of times what tends to happen is youth tend to slow down. They tend to um, be worried and think their dog's going to run. So then they slow down so that they can hopefully catch their dog. And that's not what you want to do. Um, so you want to walk normal. You keep upbeat, keep fast paced, just like you were on leash. Um, some things that we've done is put um, fishing line, tied a hook, fishing line to a hook and um, put it on a popsicle for the kids to hang on to it. So they don't have the leash there but they um, still have something connected to them per se. So the kids can have confidence that they, their dog's not gonna run away, first of all. I mean, obviously if you have a big dog with a fishing line, I mean, you obviously still wanna pay attention, but for most dogs, that's a good way if, if it's not going well. Um, other than that, um, we, we do do it with little short six inch, four inch leashes. If they get too far away, then um, you know, we guide them back into that heel position and remind them lots of treats, lots and lots of treats. We use that as well. Um, you know, remind them that they're a good dog when they're in that heel position. Um, voice, that's the biggest thing that we use when it comes to off leash healing and encouraging them to be in there. Um, so it's a lot of it is just working with the dogs repeatedly and gaining confidence between the two, the team themselves of doing the off leash healing. We do a couple things different. Um, we walk faster because as you move faster, the dog has to pay more attention to you. Yeah. So contradictory to what the kids think of if I go slow, he'll go slow. Moving no, no. fast, oh, they're watching you. The other thing we do is you can take the leash and weigh it and take um, washers and hook them to a clip. And that leash, that, that clip with the washers on it feels like they have a leash on them and you slowly take a washer off and they slowly get weaned off of the weight of that leash. There were questions about Brace and four dog team that I'd like to cover. And it looks like we're running out of time here. Uh, Brace is two dogs working together as one unit. It's, I'm not sure how much of an entry we've had at the state. I, I've always been busy when that's been run at state. Um, well, there's usually several on both days. There's usually okay. a lot of juniors and also a lot of seniors. Okay. Excellent. We, uh, when we rewrote the rules, we made the option of using a coupler, which is a link or a leash with a ring to connect the two dogs optional. Uh, you can either use it or not use it. Personally, I used it on a, a dog and had my show dog permanently damaged because he had a faster recall. So I, if you have a dog with a fast recall, I would recommend not doing it. 
one of the problems with brace is that you've got two dogs that are used to sitting in front of you. Uh, one dog can sit in front of you, the other dog can't. So that's something you have to negotiate there with them. Figure so it out. In the videos for brace, um, there are ways to train that. Um, we, in the videos, you'll see that actually when I was doing it, we actually have the dogs one sit at each leg we don't you don't have one sit in front of you you have a dog at each leg you have a treat at each leg guiding them into a leg um okay. so that is something different um we do train i in that video there is a faster more exuberant dog than um the other dog um i was taking a totally second year dog versus a totally veteran dog and yes, my the uh, the parcel Russell or the Jack Russell is a much more exuberant dog than my older Sheltie, um, and not nothing was harmed. Um, my Sheltie was actually <laughs> on a deadlock collar, so the choke the choke chain actually cannot. Um, it's on basically a collar; it's, it it can't correct them at all. Um, whereas the Jack Russell had his on regularly. So um, there's very good, the videos, and yes, I know the wins in there. Um, but there's, with the videos, there's, you know, narration of, you know, how to judge it, um, how it's judged. Um, when it's judged, it's actually judged where, like, if there's a crooked sit and a no sit, it's going to be deducted for the no sit because that's actually a higher point deduction um, mm -hmm. than if you have a crooked sit. Um, both judged. What'd you say? They're actually both judged. They have a crooked sit and a no sit. Yeah. yeah. So both. and then it, it comes so. down to you know which which is more. Um, so um, I guess with brace, yes, you want you want the team working uniformly overall. And then same thing with the finish. Um, you know that's you know obviously with the finish, it's not that such a such a big deal. But you have to teach that dog if they're doing their around around finish that, you know, that dog has to get up first and go around mm -hmm. and then, you know, come around and sit. Um, so you, you still have a, you don't have a dog sitting in front of you for the recall. The dogs have to come and sit at basically at your legs. Mm -hmm. And one of my favorite classes to participate in to teach is four dog team. Uh, the kids like it a lot and the dogs seem to enjoy it. Uh, each county can send two teams to state, and each handler right. and each they can send two dogs or two teams to state if both teams get blue ribbons. Okay, with that caveat, or both get red, or both get yeah. Okay. No, if um, oh, it's only top red, isn't it? It's only the top red, and if if there's only two teams in a county and one gets a blue and one gets a red, only the blue team gets the blue to go. Team goes forward. Okay. Um, if you're doing uh, two different teams, if you have enough to do two different teams, it's nice to have dogs that are close together in size. It's just easier for the dogs and for the handlers. And this event is often done in breed specialties, not so often in obedience trials. And what we do in Hennepin County is we have the hand we have the handlers put their dogs in a downstay. And they learn the footwork. The dogs already know everything that they need to know. They know the exercises. And so we have the handlers do the walking. We have the handlers do the healing pattern. Uh, we have the handlers work through the figure eight to make sure that they're staying as a group. It's really impressive to watch. And it's kind of fun. Sometimes the dogs sit there and watch them. It's like, hmm, what are they doing? And the... Uh, uniformity is important. So people are wearing, let's say, the same colored shirt and slacks and shoes or whatever. So they look like a unit, which is very fun. And seems to be one of the favorite classes for people to watch. They, If you have a space to do it in, it is wonderful. Yeah. And um, some things with the dog team, just remember that in 4-H, any youth team can do a four-dog team. 
Um, it mm -hmm. they do not have to all be the same breed of dog like nope. in other organizations. They don't. Have, it, it's all across the board. Um, we do usually in our county. Um, we do um, usually try to have kids at least completed um, grad year because you do do the longer recalls. You do do the longer long sits and downs. Um, and they really need to, they really need to, the more solid they are on that, the better. Um, I'm not saying that you can't take a beginner dog um, and do it with them because you truly can. Um, it just makes it a little bit harder and a little bit more time consuming because this beginner dog hasn't trained fully for, um, you know, what is expected for the four dog team. And remember the four dog team score sheet follows, does not follow the beginner class. Okay. That's where some people don't realize they're like, oh, well, you know, this is our first year. You, we can do a four dog team. That's not how it is. No. Um, so make sure you're looking at the four dog team rule sheet to know how each exercise goes. Yes, it's very similar, um, but there are still differences. Okay. And then along with the team uniformity, the biggest thing that we see at state, and I've tried to catch um, other counties before yeah. they've gone in the ring, is you cannot, it she is in the guidebook in general that you cannot have any okay. description of okay. like, any county identifier on your shirts. That's okay. True. So any that kind is of identifier. Huge, any identifier. Huge thing that we see at state because they want, um, you know, they, they want, they are proud of their county. They are, they all are very proud of their county. And we love that fact. However, when we go in the ring, we cannot identify on that. Okay. Um, so if, you know, I asked teams, I told them to just go to the bathroom and turn their shirts inside out. It's a quick fix. You don't have to worry about it. Um, it's fine. Also, you know, there's some stipulations that like will be talked at. I know it judges things. Um, about team uniformity, you know, boys and girls are being on teams. So, you know, everybody feels as if they have to have the same shoes, the same pants and the same shirts. Um, that's not always so easy to do when you have girls and boys on the same team. Um, so just kind of take that into consideration when you're picking out uniforms. Um, you know, we always just went to Walmart or Target and got basic shoes. Um, the three, four, well, they may be $5 shoes now. I don't know what they are. Um, but, and then we used them for the year. Um, and then we just went and got plain, they picked a color of cotton shirts. Okay, that's another 10 bucks. And then we maybe picked a pair of shorts. Well, that's another 10 bucks. So we try to keep the uniforms as simple as possible um, and basic and just went from there. It, do, it does not have to be anything fancy, um, anything super expensive, nothing like that. Um, so just know, you know, do your best to look the same, you know, have the same somewhat the same washes of jeans so that you know something like that um we have some oh, 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 i was ahead. gonna say we have some questions that we should maybe address unless uh, did, did you have some more things about four dog team jessica before we move on to these um, questions that people are asking in here the biggest thing with four dog team i guess is just um you know you need to everybody train their everybody works a little bit differently everybody's dog needs to work a little differently and they need to decide as youth as a team to come together and decide how they're going to come to a common compromise of how to do those things um when they are doing the, the biggest thing is like the stands and the stays you know not everybody gets their dog to stand for the stand for exam the same way so therefore you want to you know decide before you even get dogs involved how are you going to stand your dogs how you're going to uniformly stand your dogs. Um, the other big thing with that stand for exam is remember off leash stand for the exam, you only go six feet. That leash isn't there, but you only go six feet. That's huge. Um, and then uh, the recalls, the recalls, I know the videos that we have out there. Yes, there's Wendy where we apologize. That's just what we were dealt. Um, I was trying to get four kids together to do it that, you know, had an idea what they were doing and four dogs and it's not easy. Okay. Um, and yes, you do have a team captain to ensure uniformity. You have a team captain to totally, um, 
talk to the whole team basically and that's kind of shown in the videos as well um but you I don't even remember where I was going with that now but yes you do have a team captain sorry you do have a team captain for that um and they're the ones that um you know are in charge to make sure that team stays all on the same side so if you line up and that team is all the way to the left or always on your left that team always starts on your left okay um even when you line up for figure eights, that team has to be on your left, no matter what side you swap, it has to be on your left. In When you go from ring to ring at state, that's when it gets very confusing. Or when you, between exercises, that's where it gets very confusing. That's where your team captain has to have that knowledge and ability to speak up to the rest of the team and be like, hey, you guys aren't on the right side. We need to be on this side, okay? Um, and trust me, it's easy to flap sides, very easy to flap sides. Um, there's lots of, lots of footwork that needs to be done. Like Judy was talking about that all, all can be done before you even put dogs. Is that together. bad? Um, so definitely take that recommendation. Yeah. You, you start with footwork for dog team starts with footwork. Um, I'm trying to think, oh, recalls. Um, that's probably one of the toughest things to do as a four dog team. Um, as you, if you've ever watched state four dog team recall exercise, it's, it's very interesting time. Um, you, you never know, no matter how well the dogs are trained or whatnot, you, you never know where the dogs are going to go. Stand um, by the something where you start out on leash. Um, you get those dogs to come for you. And remember for the recall exercise for four dog team, you don't have to say dogs come. It's their name and come. Okay, so there's lots of different ways you can kind of have fun games with recalls to make sure the dogs are paying attention to you. You know, we do a lot of a um, couple people will go oh. short, a couple people will go long, a couple people will, you know, go, you know, the edge, edge people will kind of make like a different line. Um, so, I mean, there's lots of different things that you can get your, um, to practice your recall recall to get those dogs to pay attention to you and hopefully come to you on show day. Um, so lots of excitement, lots of happy recalls. We hardly ever practice formal recalls when it comes to, um, recalls just because, you know, we want the dogs, encourage the dogs to stay happy and come to their actual owners. Um, lots and lots of treats, um, and lots of praise. I cannot stress that enough when it comes to the recalls. Oh, okay, um, so, I, uh, we, I think we need to start addressing, we only have a half hour left and it, we, there's yep. lots of uh, things in the chat room. So let me read the questions and we can start answering them. What is the option instead of treats when the dog gets food stupid as all they can think of is food? Okay, um, I answered that if the dog is focusing on just on food, it's past the time to do random interval reinforcement, not every behavior gets a reward uh, randomly, not every third, not every fifth, every whatever. And then certainly transition to secondary reinforcement, which is praise. Uh, if they're just obsessing on food, we've made a brat. Personally, I, I totally take food away. It totally goes by voice. They, they no longer get reinforced by treats except for like at the very end of an exercise, but it either goes to a voice of good dog or a praise. And you totally, you totally remove the food. Um, that it, the food is initially just to reinforce the behavior. Once they start getting it, it's like every once in a while, every very, very rare once in a while. Okay, okay. the next <laughs> question. Yes. Do you let dogs that don't qualify for fair that year attend classes, Clover Buds dog, 4-H's new puppy, et cetera, to observe and acclimate the class environment or dogs and handlers that are qualified for fair only? Let me address what we do in Anoka County. Only the dogs that are doing training are allowed out there. We have a large program, and so we only have the kids and dogs that are in training. Other dogs, puppies, are not allowed and we do not have a clover bud program in Anoka County. Um, so I don't know how some of you other counties handle that. Um, I think counties that I've seen, um, 
they have a parent who takes the clover buds, no dogs, because clover buds aren't allowed to handle their own dogs. And we don't want the parents teaching the dog. So they take the clover buds and work on projects. Um, some of the things they've done, they've made um, toys for the dogs. They made beds for the dogs. They talk about taking care of the dog, what they eat, um, how they give them a bath. They teach them things that are relevant to dog, but they don't have a dog with them. Some, some counties let the kids bring, let co clover buds come and bring a stuffed toy. And they're allowed to work that stuffed toy. And then they actually can show that stuffed toy at the fair and get judged for having the dog working through the exercises. Um, I have seen counties that allow people who are not even 4-Hers to bring their dogs to class. Some don't, so that you have to talk over with the extension office and find out if they're willing to let them be there. Um, and then obviously that's the trainers have to agree that yes, it's okay, we can work with them, um, but they're not supposed to get the attention of the trainer during training time. So if they wanna stay afterwards and ask questions or need extra help, they can do that. But the focus still has to be on the 4-H'er. Okay. So we are a county that has a clover bud program. Um, so what happens is usually they come at the same time as our beginner kids do or our foundation kids do. And obviously their parent or older sibling or older junior leader are on the leash. So they are usually actually on the outside of our training area. Um, and they are, they are there getting explained to what the exercises are, what they're expected of. But instead of the trainer um, kind of making sure that they're doing it correctly, it is whoever is on the leash. Granted, we don't expect them to do it perfect. But the nice thing is with clover buds, they can practice that sits and downs and whatnot without having to worry about the hassle of the leash because the parent has it. So they can do all that stuff with all the treats and all that stuff without the hassle of that leash. And it's phenomenal. Like I said, we have them on the outskirts. We check in with them. Um, periodically, or if they're having major issues. Um, but other than that, we do allow the clover buds to be there during our beginner sessions, just because it, it, it does help. Um, now with new puppies, I guess we require our, like anything new like that to at least be, has to be six months by our show. Um, and that should be a dog that is expected to be shown at the fair. Um, so so Anybody funny. who's in our class started, um, this is said, hey, working towards being no, at the No, I'm not. Yes, show. you are. Okay, then I'll take over. <laughs> I don't know. So, Carl. Um, so, hey, yeah. So I, we do have, we do have there, so that's how we do it. So yeah, if we you also okay. have puppies, you'd have to make sure they are old enough to have had a rabies vaccination. Yeah. And that has to be done before they could come to any class at the very yeah. end. Okay. Uh, the next question, how many counties have their dog show during their county fair? Again, I'll answer for Anoka County. We do our agility show during the county fair and our obedience uh, showmanship and rally the Saturday after our county fair is done. So I don't know other counties you want to pipe in? We have our separately and we split it over two days. Yep. Yeah. Most counties that I've judged are two days and not during the fair. I haven't done a fair for probably five years. Okay. Well, Marlene, I did yours, but yeah. And you <laughs> are this year. Even that one. I haven't done a fair for probably five years. And okay, there was one here saying that cl clover buds um, for somebody is not shown at the fair. And I guess just to reiterate, in our county, we actually do have the clover buds come and do. Um, an actual like healing pattern and stuff, obviously with the adult completely, not all of our clover buds do it. You know, there's three years of clover buds. So our first year clover buds may only come and talk to the judge. Judge may only ask them, Hey, what's your dog's name? You know, what do you feed it? You know, do you water it? What do you do for grooming? So, I mean, right. that's all varies by County. And that, that was a question that I saw. Somebody had a question about the grooming component for foundation. And that's just a way to give bonus points basically to the foundation kids. They get to be judged on how well their dog is brushed, whether their ears are clean and so on. They're not 
basically want to, we want a clean dog in the ring. Basically, the judge looks at the dog, checks their toenails, looks in their ears. It's not a formal grooming exercise. It's no. not a do you, are you clean? Yeah, pretty much. And it's an easy couple points. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> more specifically with that is like when when does that happen during their their portion when they're being judged like is it when they're doing like I know for was it the graduate beginner they have like a sit for exam yes okay I've got the score sheet for foundation in front of me so they do the heel on leash and figure eight then they do for the the sit on exam uh, for, mm-hmm. uh, the sit for exam on leash and heel position, and then grooming. And what it says for the grooming, the coat it must be clean, smooth, not scaly, free from loose hair. Ears clean inside. Eyes clean. Toenails not excessively long. Absence of flea fleas, lice, mites, ticks, or other external uh, parasites. Then they do the recall on leash with no finish and the sit stay for 10 seconds um, on the six foot leash. So your grooming is almost always after however they perform the sit or stand. So they finish the exercise, the judge will say exercise finished. And then generally the, the youth will have the dog sit down and then the judge will come up and look at them. Yep. Mm-hmm. It's not so, part of that same exercise. On, okay. the, on the grooming, the judges are not supposed to be touching the dog. So how do they check the ears of a floppy-eared dog? How are they? Why are they not supposed to be touching the dog? That's what they were told. Loretta, do you want to touch on that? Because um, I don't know who told you that. I touch the dogs. Yeah. I'll look in their ears. Um, my it, daughter was I've, my daughter I've was seen, taught that at the, my daughter was taught that at the judges training. I've seen judges pick up feet and look, move the hair out of the way. Um, they can rub the hair backwards. I don't know. The only time that. I would foresee a judge not touching a dog is per se, possibly a dog that may be reactive. Mm-hmm. Um, that's when you would ask the youth to please show you the ear, the inside of the ears. Please show me the toenails. Um, please show me the yeah. coat. Um, but all I, I apologize for her being told that, but from what I know, that has, that's not the way that judges do that grooming because they do have to see see inside those ears i think the part that you might be talking about is not that grooming element or or that following but that the sit and stand for exam the judge won't walk up and touch the back of the dog three times yeah anymore but that's that's the sit and stand for exam part yeah that's that's separate from the the, okay so so for for this past year with the covid um yeah for they were for the virtual show um we took out the exam part of the stand for exam but that's not gone forever that's still Mm -hmm. The, the judge will still come up. What it and- says in the um, exercise descriptions, and that's why it's important for all of you to have the guidelines because it goes through. What it says here is the judge will approach the dog from the front using the fingers and palm of one hand. The judge will touch only the dog's head. Yep, that's the foundation. And that's yep. the foundation. Yep. And that changes, of course, for the beginners where it goes to the dog or master standing in position without moving its feet and must show no sinus or resentment as the judge touches the dog's head, back, and hind quarters only. So the judge is going to still touch the head, the back, and the hind corners. Mm -hmm. However, they are not going to do a full body exam. Right, even in the utility and and Mm -hmm. the utility where they check the dog, they still will only touch certain areas of the dog. They'll never touch their genitals. She clarified that 
it, she was told that you're not supposed to let the dog sniff your hand right. before you start the exam. Mm-hmm. Right, that was changed. Yes, that was changed. So. And then there's a comment in here, um, and judges, you could uh, answer this probably. It says, isn't it the case that the judge can change the order of the elements, or do you have to go in the order that's on the score sheet? It goes in the order of the score sheet. It goes in the order of the score sheet. Okay, that's, that's what I thought, so. If you change the order, it would have to be done for the entire class. Yep. Correct. And, and that is the thing, and that has happened. Okay, I, I, we, it happened at my son's um, ring at state. Okay, it was right when we changed the obedience rules. It was a grad beginner where they did um, the T, the, uh, the, the T exercise for the stays. And being that the rules had changed, you know, we we're all in the other rule book mode. Um, the judge actually dim- dismissed the kids after their rec- or their finish on the recall because he just passed the fact that um, they uh, had that had those uh, T patterns for the long sits and downs. So what had to happen was that after every recall, those kids had to be dismissed just like the, that first person and had to be brought back into the ring in order to do those T patterns. Okay, so yes, like Loretta said, if you change it for one person, it has to be changed for the whole class. Okay, and 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 it's gonna happen. Okay, you (laughs) mistakes happen. We're human. Accidents happen. Um, So just know we're doing you have all the jumps you might do the jumps in the wrong order and yeah you just have to be consistent and do it wrong for everybody yep Yep. and that's the same thing with i know this is an agility but that's the same thing in agility if you jump one dog at that then you have to do it have to per se keep if it's the wrong table then you have to keep that table in there so that's across the board for any aspect of the dog of the dog show you have if you do it wrong for one in the class you have to finish the class that way so if they're in a class and they're supposed to be jumping uh 12 inches and the say just the tire jump got missed and it's at four inches it has to stay at four inches for the rest of the class correct mm-hmm. yep okay. mm-hmm. So is there any other questions about brace for dog team or anything that we haven't discussed in the obedience aspect? Um, frequency of homework. Um, we recommend that kids train usually about 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes at a time, twice a day. And you can train while you're doing all sorts of other stuff. You can practice your stays when you're doing dishes or whatever. You can integrate training anywhere in your daytime. It's good to see while commercials are on TV because they're kind. Exactly. <laughs> commercials are great. Um, and I always recommend or that they end all training sessions on a positive note. And everybody has bad days. The dog, people have bad days. Your dog has bad days. And sometimes it's better just to do something that the dog can do, shake hands, sit, anything and call it a day. Just quit while you're ahead. And part of our role as trainers is that while we're having